Every builder loves the sight of this. A fresh slab ready to start framing. A house is about to go vertical. On the build show today, we're actually gonna be talking about this foundation I'm walking on. This is a slab on grade foundation, and in particular, a post tension slab. We're gonna talk about the pros and cons of the system. I'm gonna tell you about how it works, and maybe I'll help you decide if this is the type of foundation you might need for your next build. Today's build show, all about slab on grade foundations. Let's get going. Slab on grade foundations, pretty common throughout the whole Southern US. Anywhere you don't have a frost line, because it doesn't get very cold, we don't have freezing temperatures very often. We don't have that heave that happens with that thaw and freeze cycling like you do in the more northern climates. So very popular to see slab on grade construction in the south. Now there's two common types of slab on grade foundations. This is one of them. This is a post tension slab. The other type of slab, which is really the one I prefer and use most, is a rebar slab. Now a rebar slab, you're gonna see a grid work of beams that go through the slab, and then there's gonna be rebar and cages that's placed in those beams. That's the typical foundation that I use in Texas where I build, but post tension is a pretty popular system. It's used quite a bit. Let's talk about the differences. Now when you think slab on grade, you're not exactly the slab on grade like your driveway. Driveways are usually four, maybe five inches thick and a rebar grid. In this case, you've at least got for sure a turn down of concrete that's going all the way down to the ground and usually embedding down either into rock or into native soil by 24 inches. Now, as opposed to the other foundation that I mentioned, which is the rebar slab, this one is gonna use much less rebar. In fact, sometimes not very much at all. And instead of rebar, we're gonna use these tensioning cables or tenons. Now this is a braided steel cable. There's usually seven or eight plies of steel. And these are gonna run front to back and side to side. Now on the back of the house, there's just a post. There's just a, uh, basically a plate that holds it in place. And then at the front of the house and this left-hand side of the house, you'll see these cables sticking out. They're gonna be on whatever the engineer tells you in terms of centers, but usually it's somewhere around 36 or 48 inch centers. And then wherever you see this, a cluster of multiple cables, usually there's a point load from something happening from above. This is probably gonna be a two-story house. This is actually not my job under construction, so I don't know the full details here. But when you see multiples, it's either gonna be a corner of the house where you've got extra strength for outside walls, or you've got something bearing, and you're seeing that here in two places. And what's gonna happen is after the slab is poured, they're gonna let it cure for anywhere from a week to maybe 10 days. And then they're gonna come back with a tensioning machine. And what that is, it's a huge machine that gets clamped on here. And they're gonna tension these. They're gonna basically pull this wire so that the concrete is, is basically pushed together. Now, if you touch this cable, you see it's all greased up right now. That's because it's in a plastic sleeve and they want it to be able to move. They don't want the concrete bonding uh, to that steel cable that's in there. They're gonna go through and tension every one of these cables and now that concrete is gonna be in compression. It's gonna be pushed together. Concrete's really good in compression, meaning I'm not gonna be able to smash it together, but it's not so good in tension, and that's why these tensioning cables are giving us the strength we need in this foundation. Now, one way that you can tell if you're looking at an older slab, if it's a rebar slab or if it's a tension slab, is look for these telltale circles. After they tension these cables, they're gonna cut them, they're gonna put an anchor post there, they're gonna grout that in, and they might come back and do a parge coat or a stucco coat just to clean up the uh, foundation formwork that you're seeing across here. But if you came back and looked at this 20, 30 years from now, you're probably gonna see these telltale circles on 36 or 48 inch centers kind of around the outside of the, of the house. And you're gonna see this typically in the easiest access point. So if you went in the back of the house, you wouldn't see any of these. You kind of can't tell what's happening. But in the front of the house where the access point is, that's the easiest way to bring the machinery in. That's where they've run all the tension cables on this front and on this side over here. Now, a couple benefits of post-tension slabs. One of the massive benefits is that by compressing this slab into one big tight ball means that the slab's nice and stiff. So if I'm built on rock, it's not as big a deal, but 
in a lot of places in the south, we have expansive clays. That's clays that as they get wet and dry, they move quite a bit. And as much as several inches, depending on where you are, there's some neighborhoods where I am in Austin, Texas that see three, four inches of movement. And that's worse than the frost uh, heave thaw cycle that you might experience in the north. Because if I didn't have a stiffened slab, my slab actually might break like this. So what we're trying to do here is make a really stiff boat that can ride the waves so that the whole house is nice and stiff. If this corner moved a little bit, we'd want the whole thing to move at once. Now the, the big benefit, if you talk to builders about this slab, or the benefit that's most talked about, I should say, is that you're gonna, in theory, see a lot less cracking on a slab like this than you would a standard rebar slab. Now in general, most of the time when you see cracks on concrete, you're seeing spider cracks or smaller cracks. If those cracks are in line with the other side, they're really not structural. They're usually shrinkage cracks. They're not anything to worry about. You need to start worrying when you see the concrete doing this, when the concrete's moving dimensionally uh, up and down differentially on one side of the crack or the other. Other than that, most of the concrete cracks that you see out there are non-structural. They're just cosmetic. The old builder's joke is there's two types of concrete. There's concrete that's cracked and there's concrete that's gonna crack. Now let's go up here and I wanna show you a particular part of this foundation that's interesting. All right, so remember how I said builders generally consider this a slab that's gonna be more crack free or less prone to cracks? There's a vulnerable time in the history of this uh, pour and that's this stage right now. This probably got poured within the last week or so the tension crew hasn't come yet. So in effect, we've got just this big lump of concrete sitting here. And if you look at this shape, very, very rectangular slab, which means we've got a lot of weight and it's gonna wanna bend down at the ends of this slab. And as a result, I think that's what's causing this. Let's see, we've got a pretty decent sized crack running here from what looks to be the front porch all the way back. And like I said earlier, there's no differential movement. As I run my hand over that, there's nothing happening there. That's just the shrinkage crack. That's nothing but an aesthetic issue, certainly not structural. There's another crack happening here, and this one's lining up, it looks like, with some floor recessed uh, boxes. And this um, in-bed plate, which is basically a piece of steel that's embedded so that a post, a structural post, could be welded to that later, may be contributing to that crack as well. But in effect, the slab is kind of falling a little bit until the tension cables get tensioned, and that's what's causing those cracks. Now, those cracks, even after it gets tensioned, will still be there. They're not going to go away, but unless we have a finished concrete slab that's going to get, let's say, stained in the future or maybe polished, you're never going to see that. When you, when you put tile over top of this, if you do hardwoods later, you're never going to see that, and it's probably not going to move more than what it has already. But it's interesting to note that that's the big reason why people typically say they're looking for post-tension slabs instead of a standard rebar slab. Now, the other reason I would tell you is they're traditionally a little less expensive. You know, rebar in particular has gone up and cost big time. Depending on what's happening with politics, sometimes there's imports on steel and tariffs and things like that. There's a ton of steel, literally probably several tons of steel, that goes into a foundation of this size. So to be able to reduce the amount of rebar and go with post-tensioning, there's definitely a cost benefit. Guys, hopefully this uh, overview of post-tension versus rebar slabs helped you. If you have a post-tension slab, I think it's a great slab. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. If you're designing a house, I might say consider a uh, standard rebar slab. I do like the ability to remodel a standard slab. That's right, I forgot to mention that. Let's think about remodeling. Now, I'm actually remodeling slash building new on a 1970s slab. Yeah! <laughs> I'm building a new house on an old slab. Now, that 70s slab is on a pretty rocky ground where I'm in my neighborhood. But if you look at the way that I could cut out my plumbing and keep the rebar in place, that's a huge benefit of a standard rebar slab compared to a post-tension slab. Let's look at these plumbing pipes right here. These pipes are running through the foundation and see that tensioning cable right here in the end? That's going straight front to back. It's probably running just a little bit on the side of this plumbing pipe. And my guess is since there's uh, water here, this is either like a, an island or maybe that's island. I'm not sure. I don't like to run too much 
uh, plumbing in my slabs. You all, of course, you always have to run your drain waste vent, but I don't like to do supply water uh, in slabs or avoid it as much as possible. But let's say we go to remodel this. You know, my son gets hired in 25 years to remodel this kitchen. If we jackhammered this and hit that cable, and if that thing gets cut accidentally, doing, we could actually have a, a, a serious accident or maybe even a death. I've heard stories of them ripping through concrete. And of course, structurally, the slab's not gonna be the same again. So you're gonna have to probably take pretty dramatic feats uh, engineering wise to fix it. So that's one big downside, I think, of these post-tension slabs is thinking about remodeling, changing this later, or also thinking about maybe adding um, a structural hard point, uh, uh, bringing some loads down, things like that. Guys, hopefully this uh, was a valuable topic for you. Um, if you want more on this particular topic or you wanna see how other slabs are built, I've got several videos on foundations. I love talking about the differences between slabs and pier and beam too. Big fan of pier and beam. I've done a bunch of conditioned crawl spaces on my pier and beam houses. I love the upgradeability of those, but I'll put a link in the description for those. And oh, by the way, check out our content over on buildshownetwork.com. We're actually doing six new videos a week from four other contributors besides myself. That's a fantastic resource to learn about some really high performance building techniques. Guys, hit that subscribe button below. We've got new content every Tuesday and every Friday. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Otherwise, we'll see you next time on The Build Show.